yeah, we're, we're all in this together. Uh, this, again, we are not Walmart. You don't come here for your one-stop shop to get what you need and then go home. Um, we're all serving and working together for the sake of the kingdom. I want to begin this morning by reading to you from John Bailey's A Diary of Private Prayer. This is an old uh, prayer book that a pastor uh, passed along to me, and I've enjoyed this book. Um, I was reading it the 15th of last month and decided that I wanted to share this with you. It just so happens that I'm also now sharing with you the reading from the 15th of this month. Listen to these words. O God, who are from eternity unto eternity and are not at one time in one place because all times and places are in you, I would now seek to understand my destiny as a child of yours. Here I stand, weak and mortal, amid the immensities of nature. But but blessed are you, O Lord God, that you have made me in your own likeness and have breathed into me the breath of your own life. Within this poor body, you have set a spirit that is akin to your own spirit. Within this corruptible, you have planted incorruption and and within this mortal immortality. So from this little room and this short hour, I can lift up my mind beyond all time and space to you the uncreated one, until the light of your countenance illumines all my life. And then he offers up some very specific prayers. Let me keep in mind that my mortal body is but the servant of my immortal soul. Let me keep in mind how uncertain is my hold upon my bodily life. Let me remember that here I have no continuing city, but only a place of sojourn and a time of testing and of training. Let me use this world as not abusing it. Let me be in this world, but not of it. Let me be as having nothing, yet possessing all things. Let me understand the vanity of the temporal and the glory of the eternal. Let my world be centered not in myself, but in you. I apologize for the somewhat irregular language. Uh, I'm sure that it seemed much less irregular when it was published 75 years ago. Um, And I'm just thankful that I was able to take out the these, thous, and thines. Uh, But I read it for you because I believe that the petition is one all God's people of any age can relate to. We struggle to see the unseen to live as members of a kingdom not visible, to let our lives be centered on ourselves, I should say not on ourselves, but on our God. We struggle to grasp the spiritual world. We have no problem grasping the physical world. We are daily inundated by the physical world. It is noisy, it is loud. Doesn't help that we have people who like to be extra loud, like that Hellcat driver whose car was impounded by the city of Seattle, or my buddy who decided that his Harley was not masculine or macho enough, so he had to put on a louder muffler, Uh, or the young guys who think that backfiring in their little cool cars is cool. Uh, I remember my father's station wagon backfiring, and my brother and I would sink down so that our friends could not see that we were in this vehicle. It's become cool, I guess. The point is, there's a lot of noise in our world. And it's only getting noisier. On our recent flight home from Nashville, a guy started a video call while we were 10,000 feet up or however, I don't know how many feet you, you go up. He wore headphones so we couldn't hear whoever he was speaking with, but we could hear him loudly. I was so grateful when the flight attendant told him, video calls are illegal on commercial flights. Now, am I sounding a little curmudgeonly yet? (laughs) Now, here's the truth. Deb will tell you, she will attest, I like loud things. I like to turn my music up loud. Uh, So it's not that I don't at times enjoy loud things, but honestly as well, 
there are times when I just want quiet. When I long for peace. It's part of the reason that I love camping, and I wrote about that in my September blog and the Lamplighter article. But it reminds me of a camping trip our family made years ago to Glacier in Montana. A handful of things stick out from that trip, like seeing a little bear scurrying alongside the road and fires that we could see actually up on the top of the mountain. Not a good thing. Uh, Hiking to a glacier-fed lake. I think Ellie and I did that, and we hiked up and got to see the glacier up above. It was beautiful. But the thing that really sticks out to me in that trip is late at night, uh, going out to the lake that we were camping on and just standing on the shore, and it was a clear night. It was beautiful. And I could pick out all the stars, not only by looking up, but by looking down into that placid lake. And just thinking, it was quiet, it was peaceful, it was a place really set apart, a a holy place. It's times like that, when the earth is still, when all the noise has fallen silent, in the presence of the majesty of God's creation, that I am filled with an awareness of how small I really am. And how great is our God. We sing about that this morning, his great name. And the fact that life is so much bigger than my little world. This is what inspires Bailey's prayer. It's a desire to be able to live each day with an awareness that life is more than my little story. God's epic story is unfolding all around us every moment. And we as his people are privileged to be a part of his story. But we need help to see his story, don't we? Because we are inundated with the world's stories. They're all around us. The noise is constant. If we would find our place in God's story, we need set-apart time to be in his presence, to hear from him. But we need spiritual help to see his story and our part therein because we are bombarded by so many other things. The problem is these distractions often keep us from seeing what is really real. So how do we grow in seeing what is really real? Enter the book of Daniel. There we go. In today's passage, Daniel is going to expand our understanding of what is really real. Things far greater than the puny things of the world which so often absorb our time and capture our attention. So here is my question for you. Do you want to live with a greater sense of perspective, of peace, of purpose? Are you longing for something that helps make sense of the chaos, that helps us quiet the noise? In Daniel's final vision, we return to themes that do just that, to themes that have dominated this book, themes of divine sovereignty and of God's loyal love. Daniel tells us that no matter what we are experiencing, God reigns and his redemptive purposes are not thwarted. His plan continues to unfold even in the midst of the noise, the distraction, the sufferings of a living in a fallen world. It is this message that continues into the final chapters and one final vision, which we will begin today, part one of a sermon entitled Prayer, Powers, and Prophetic Hope. I invite you to turn with me, if you would, to Daniel chapter 10. Throughout this series, we've considered the difficulty of relating to a 2,500-year-old book written to people who were forcibly driven from their home in the face of war. Makes me think a little bit about the people of Ukraine and the people of Gaza. Uh, Those people understand uh, being driven from your home in such a fashion. Yet I've also shared throughout this sermon series that there are times when we feel like exiles 
in this world, especially in the face of violence, anti-biblical narratives, and the constant conflicts and hostilities we face. I would argue, therefore, that Daniel's message to the Jews is just as needful for you and me today. What is that message? God is in control. We belong to a greater kingdom, and we have an unshakable hope. Certainly, this was the message of the first half of the book of Daniel, chapters 1 through 6, where Daniel and his friends overcame oppression and persecution in the royal courts, including a fiery furnace and a lion's den. But it is in the second half of Daniel, chapter 7 through 12, that we have seen this message of divine sovereignty and hope conveyed all the more powerfully by means of this apocalyptic literature that we've been reading. The, the dramatic imagery of apocalyptic narrative pulls back the curtain on realities far above and beyond our own little stories to remind us that God's got this. It is this same message of divine sovereignty and hope delivered through apocalyptic that we find in the final three chapters of Daniel. Chapters 10, 11, and 12 are kind of like a bologna sandwich on wheat bread, if you will. I hated bologna as a kid. I just don't understand it. Dirk, do you like bologna? Yeah. Baloney, in my book, is nasty stuff. My apologies to all of you baloney fans. You can have all the baloney because I don't need any. But, but, I think of it like a baloney sandwich with wheat bread. Now, wheat bread is supposed to be good for you, but it's not the tastiest bread, right? I mean, look at me. Do you think I eat a lot of wheat bread? I, you know. But, Daniel chapter 11 is the bologna in the sandwich. Chapters 10 and 12 are the wheat bread. They're good for you. Okay, 11 is a little hard to swallow, I'll be honest with you. But chapters 10 and 12, they're good for you, and, and, and we need it. It's, it's healthy, it's good stuff. Uh, actually, chapter 10 in this bologna sandwich is just the introduction to this vision. So we're just getting started there in chapter 10, and as far, it's as far as we're going to get today. We're only going to finish chapter 10. Yet in this introduction, we find out that life consists of more than just that which we see. There are realities beyond the realities that feel most pressing to us day in and day out. Or to use the words of Christian artist Stephen Curtis Chapman, there is more to this life. And that's the first point on your sermon outline. If you didn't get one, there are extras on the back table. Follow along as I read Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. We'll pause there. These verses are just the introduction to the introduction. We do see that we've progressed beyond the last Babylonian king and even beyond Darius the Mede, Cyrus, king of Persia, is running things. This is the same Cyrus, by the way, that we read about in Ezra Nehemiah a few years ago. You can check out that series on our website. But he's the one who allowed the Israelites to return, to come out of captivity, to come back for the rebuilding of the temple. But Daniel is not with those who return. We've talked about this. Daniel stays. Uh, probably into his 80s. He remains in Babylon, it would seem, until the end of his life. This may be part of the reason for the reference to his Babylonian name. This may be the author's just small way to remind us he's still in captivity. The Babylonian empire is gone at this point. But Daniel's still there under the new 
king, the new ruler. Maybe the reason he's still there is so that he can continue to receive these visions that point us to divine hope. Does it sound good to you to receive a vision? I'm not sure it is. Look at verses 2 and 3. How is Daniel responding to receiving this vision? He's, he's mourning. <laughs> he, he refuses to eat choice food like meat and wine, which you do, you know, when you're in mourning, you, you, do, you don't want anything to eat. He even refuses lotions, which in this day before pulsating shower heads would be like refusing to take a bath. He's so troubled in spirit, he can't even think about personal hygiene. And this goes on for three weeks. We continue in verse 4. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude. So first of all, the location uh, that we're talking about here is likely near Babylon. So if you can, I did something. I pushed, I pushed a button I've never pushed before. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, okay. We're good. We're good. I got it. Don't push, don't push that button. Um, there it is. <laughs> this is the button I meant to push. Babylon. Uh, so, you know, he's somewhere in, in this realm. So you see the Tigris the Euphrates come together. So he's seeing this vision here. Um, and there's some otherworldly individual with him. We're not told exactly, is it God? Is it an angel? It does have some similarity to the description we find of Jesus in Revelation. However, there are things we'll read about it later on that make us think, nah, it's probably not Jesus here. Um, but this being is definitely supernatural and a very clear indication of the existence here of spiritual realities. The most recent book Keith and I are reading with our Renton Gospel Network is by a renowned British theologian who, among other things, preached at the Queen's Balmoral Castle. He is known in part for challenging anti-supernaturalistic theologians. Now, think about that for a second. A theologian who is anti-supernaturalistic. In other words, he only believes in the material world. Now, does that seem like a, a conflict of interest? It is. <laughs> How do you read this book and not believe in the supernatural? But there, there's a lot of them. Um, so this man, he, he speaks ag against these folks. He challenges them um, and in a very significant way, or at least he did uh, as he was walking this earth. Um, but, you know, we live in an age where belief in the supernatural isn't cool. As one of our members shared at Sunday's annual picnic, her coworkers were talking about how none of them were religious. So they asked her, are you religious? And she answered, well, I'm, I'm a Christian. <laughs> uh, by the way, someone gifted me this hat. Pastor warning Anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. So it would be good just, just to warn you. If you're chatting with me, I, I, you know, it's just the way it is. My kids learned that long ago. Uh, Parker is going to learn that too. When he has the ability to know things like that. Uh, Daniel definitely believed in spiritual realities. Yet despite the number of visions he experienced, he still found them overwhelming. Look at verses 7 to 9. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. Daniel is overwhelmed. He's exhausted. He's spent. His companions didn't actually see the vision, but obviously they see enough to know that they should run and hide. 
It is in the midst of Daniel's trepidation that we read in verses 10 and 11, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I've now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. The word esteemed here is the same word that we saw in chapter 9 in a previous angelic visitation. Do you know where else we find this word? It's actually found in the Ten Commandments. It's number 10. You shall not covet. It's actually the same Hebrew word as the one translated esteemed here. But in Daniel, it's positive. A source of comfort, an indication that Daniel is coveted by God. God treasures him. He desires him. He loves him. We may not know what it is to be overwhelmed by a heavenly vision, but we do know about feeling overwhelmed, spent, frail. God's message to us as his people, it's like what we read in 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. That's the message the angel leads with. God cares for you, Daniel. You are highly esteemed. Anxiety drives Daniel to pray for wisdom, and God responds. Look at verses 12 through 14. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I've come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. What this angel reveals to Daniel is not only the existence of spiritual realities, but more specifically, the reality of spiritual warfare. Verse 13 tells us that a spiritual power, the prince of Persia, kept the angel from coming in response to Daniel's prayer. I appreciate this commentary. The picture that emerges from Daniel 10, 12 to 14 is that of a heavenly conflict. On the one side stands those spiritual forces that emanate from the Lord. The speaker, who is an unnamed angelic power, and Michael fight on God's side. Michael, whose Hebrew name means who is like God, is mentioned four places in the Bible besides here. Throughout the Bible, he plays an important leadership role in God's heavenly army. He is called chief prince and archangel. In a word, he is a powerful spiritual being. On the other side stands the prince of the Persian kingdom, who himself is powerful, but we are to understand that he is evil as well. He has tried to keep the heavenly messenger away from Daniel, but has not succeeded though the fight is far from over. The fight is far from over. Again, what we have here is the pulling back of the curtain so that we can see the unseen spiritual conflict that goes on all around us. One theologian writes, if once the curtain were pulled back and the spiritual world behind it came into view, it would expose to our spiritual vision a struggle so intense, so convulsive, sweeping everything within its range that the fiercest battle fought on earth would seem by comparison a mere game. Not here, but up here. That is where the real conflict is engaged. Our earthly struggle drones in its backlash. I remember these verses from Daniel being shared at a student-led prayer meeting that I participated in at a high school Christian camp circa 1990. Did you catch all that? I went to camp. I was one of the campers, high school camp. And during our free time, uh, a group of students, uh, one of my friends said, hey, we're getting together for a time of prayer. And I'm sure I must have thought back then, oh, so it's free time and we're going to go pray. That sounds great. 
Um, I, I'm guessing it was a cute girl who invited me to that prayer time. Um, I can't be sure. Um, but a bunch of kids sitting around praying. The guy who led our prayer time, a fellow high schooler, emphasized the fact that when we pray, we impact spiritual realities and are engaging in spiritual warfare. He also shared during the prayer time about the time Elisha and his servant were surrounded by an army and the servant was scared. Then Elisha asked Yahweh to open his servant's eyes saying, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. When his eyes were open, he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire, the army of the Lord. That's in 2 Kings 6. But it was through this prayer time and as his student was sharing that my eyes were opened as a high schooler and I was moved to join a nationwide movement of student-led groups that was called Prayer Warriors. My good friend uh, who was visiting us recently reminded me of this group because he was part of that group. It started out with just three of us in our public high school in a classroom at 6.45 on a Tuesday morning and it grew to 30. I, I didn't realize, I look around at the group like, I didn't know these people were Christian. I didn't know there were other Christians in our school. This is amazing. And so we would gather. We did that for two years. Um, but it's pretty amazing to think of high school students getting up. We had to get up long before 645 uh, to, to get there and to pray together. I still remember, I can see vividly, because I lived out in the country, pulling up to a, a girl's house. Uh, to pick her up, to take her to the prayer time. And, you know, in the country, it's all dark. There are no, there, there are no lights. We, you know, we just didn't have lights back then out there. So it's all dark, pitch black, and I'm shining my lights on their house as she comes out and we go drive and go pray together with these fellow students. Uh, it was good. It was a good time, but it was, it was an expression of the fact that there's more to this life than the things that we see. That there are spiritual realities if we have eyes to see them. So what inspired this sort of behavior for a teenage Dan Gannon? Well, it was a recognition that there was more to life than MTV. I'll confess to you, as a high schooler, I did want my MTV. Uh, trendy clothes, cool car. I mean, these are the things I aspired to. But then God was also tugging at my heart saying, Dan, there's more than these things. Now, you may not be a high schooler who wants to wear trendy clothes, but I suggest that all of us have things that pull us in a direction, in the direction of the things of this world to distract us. And that God, in his gentle whisper, says, come here, come my child, experience a, a better kind of life, uh, something that's real. Isn't this what Jesus says in John 10? Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Do you believe that there are spiritual powers we cannot see that wield power over evil ends that are seeking to move us away? Now, I love the way God does this. This morning, we sang Martin Luther's song, which is one of the few hymns that we sing that actually refer specifically to the person of Satan and spiritual powers in a very direct way. Now, by the way, I was supposed to preach this sermon last week, but in God's perfect timing, when I planned these songs a month ago, he knew. Yes, there are spiritual powers. Martin Luther had us sing about them when he wrote that hymn. But it's a reality we see all around us. Do you believe that Satan exists? I came across this great poem. No one knows for sure who wrote it, but it's quoted as early back as G. Campbell Morgan, a British pe preacher who was born in 1863. The poem is titled, Who Does the Mischief? Men don't believe in a devil now, as their fathers used to do. They reject one creed because it's old for another because it's new. There's not a print of his cloven foot nor a fiery dart from his bow to be found in the earth or air today, at least they declare it so. But who is it that mixes the fatal drought that palsies heart and brain and loads the beer of each passing year with its hundred thousand slain? But who blights the bloom of the land today with fiery breath of hell? If it isn't the devil that does the work, who does? Won't somebody tell? 
Who dogs the steps of the toiling saint? Who spreads the net for his feet? Who sows the tares in the world's broad field where the Savior sows his wheat? If the devil is voted not to be, is the verdict therefore true? Someone is surely doing the work the devil was thought to do. They may say the devil has never lived. They may say the devil is gone. But simple people would like to know who carries the business on. C.S. Lewis, author of the Chronicles of Narnia, wrote a book titled The Screwtape Letters. I will confess it's not my favorite of C.S. Lewis's book. It's just not. But uh, I appreciate the point. It's all about a senior demon teaching a younger demon how to most effectively cause the downfall of a new Christian that he's assigned to. It is fiction, so I don't know that I would derive my theology of demons from the book, but it is clear from scripture that there are supernatural powers in this world that stand opposed to the kingdom of Christ. And anyone seeking evidence in the goings on in our world does not have to look very far. The reality of spiritual forces of evil and darkness around us, it's, it's self-evident. As we return to Daniel, we find that he is absolutely overwhelmed by this revelation of spiritual realities, verses 15 through 19. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I'm helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man highly esteemed. He said, peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. Once again, we see a Daniel overwhelmed by this vision. And once again, we see the angel telling him to fear not and be at peace and be strong. We continue in verse 20. So he said, do you not know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. We see yet more of this spiritual warfare among powers that are not of this world. Even so, the messenger is committed to the task at hand, sharing this final revelation with Daniel, the revelation that's recorded in chapter 11. As I said, we'll not be going into that today. We will do it next Sunday in part two. Um, but I want to give you a mission, uh, 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 some homework, if you will, uh, all you high school uh, prayer warriors out there. Um, read Daniel 11 before we come together next week, if you would, because we're not going to be able to read the whole thing during the sermon. This is a lengthy piece of text we're going to be looking at, but I encourage you to read it in advance, and we'll be touching on it and then going into chapter 12 next Sunday. But I want to go back to the final verse of chapter 10 for a moment, verse 21. The first sentence of verse 21 says, but first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. An older commentator writing in the late 1800s uh, writes regarding this, the scripture of truth, that's how he translates it, is the book in which God has designated beforehand, according to truth, the history of the world as it shall certainly be unfolded. In other words, the book of truth here refers to the story of God. You need to know it's not popular uh, in especially elitist circles to believe in a meta-narrative. Have you heard people talk about that? I, maybe you've heard me talk about that. A meta-narrative says that there's an overarching reality that's bigger than our individual realities. Can you see why that would not be popular? My reality is reality. Forget the meta-narrative. There's no overarching truth. It's just me. My truth. Your truth. We've all got truth. Never mind that they all conflict with each other, but they're all truth. You speak your truth. I'll speak my truth. 
But you know, that goes out the window if God is. And by the way, that is what his personal covenant name means. I am, or the God who is. If God is, then it's not about my truth, it's about his truth, because it's all his story. Even among those who profess to be followers of Jesus, this concept is under attack. Obviously, among the cultural elite, the concept of truth has been under attack for centuries. Well, you have your beliefs, and I have my beliefs, and we're all free to believe what we want to believe anyway, right? But freedom to believe what you want to believe misses the point I'm driving at here. Yes, certainly, you can believe that you're a fairy princess if you want to. Go ahead. But just because you believe it doesn't make it so. The question is whether or not there is truth outside of you and me and whether or not we embrace the truth as authoritative in our own lives. Earlier, I mentioned our pastor's group, the Retton Gospel Network, I'm really looking forward to our first gathering after our summer break, and that's this week, this Wednesday, we're going to be getting together. But this group represents different denominations and church traditions. However, we are all committed to the Word of God as infallible and authoritative. Because of this, the controversial topics that so often make headlines in our culture, they're not controversial for our group. We all agree. But it's not because we all got together and said, hey, should we agree on all these things? It's because we hold this book as our authority. This is not rocket science, folks. Is this book true or not? If it's not, then throw it away and live your life however you want. But if it's true, then then bow your knee to the words here, not because it's a book, but because of who authored it this book, because when you bow before this book, you're bowing before the one who wrote it, and he is the God of all creation. He is the king of glory. And so somewhere I was preaching here a moment ago, uh, yes, this is true for all Christians, that this is our authority those who choose to view life by Scripture's lens. And that's our first application point. View life by Scripture's lens. It doesn't come naturally. Because our tendency, we are so full of ourselves. I am just so smart. I can figure everything out on my own. Thank you, God. I'll use your book as a guide, but when I don't like what it says, I'll make it right. I'll fix it for you. Right? No. View life by scripture's lens. That's the opposite of viewing life through my lens, my life's lens, my story. In the 60s, a new way to read literature was birthed called reader response criticism. You familiar with that? It maybe didn't get much uh, airtime uh, among general people, but up in the academic sphere, it was very popular. Um, rather than seeking the meaning that resides in a book, They sought to interpret books by their own experience. As a result, rather than a tale of two cities having one meaning, the meaning the author intended, it would have an endless array of differing meanings because you read it based on your hermeneutic. That's a fancy way for saying uh, how you read or understand things. Uh, So there's all these different hermeneutics by which you read things, and so you can read into it whatever you want to. Um, since each reader is the source of meaning in themselves. Again, it all goes back to the popular postmodern belief that there is no meta narrative, no meaning outside of the self. If you read scripture that way, if you read it seeking not what the divinely inspired author intended, but what it means for you according to your experiences and do- desires, then you must turn Hebrews 4:12 on its head. For the Word of God is living and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Scripture judge me? I will be the judge of Scripture. I know we may not say that out loud, but when we go to the Bible and when we twist things just a little to fit what our culture says is right, then we're, we're saying, I'm the judge of Scripture. 
ultimately then, I'm the judge of God. We've become God. We're our own little gods, each with our own little truths. I shared this uh, last Sunday in regard to that sermon I heard on Philippians 4, where the preacher put his, inserted his agenda over the, what Paul was trying to say. But, but that's a problem with such preaching. Instead of Scripture judging me, I become Scripture's judge. By the way, anyone know what the name Daniel means? God is my judge. Yeah. Danny, how do you know that? Oh, I don't know. yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, God is my judge. Daniel's behavior all throughout this book reflects the fact that he sought not his own agenda, he, his own will, but God's will. Yet it's because of Israel's unwillingness to bow to God's will that put them in this mess in the first place. This is why they're in captivity, because they said, no, God, we got this. They rejected his truth. They rejected the story of God and the part that he called them to play. Rather than seeing it as God's story in which they played a part, they tried to make God conform to their stories, not unlike that which we read in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve. But Daniel's message is clear. This is our father's world. It's his story. God is sovereign and God is faithful. This message is meant to encourage us exiles. Let me share one more quote with you from this commentator. It says, the fact that God has scripted history. Because he, it, before this, he talks about the fact some people, God scripts history? What about free will? By the way, I, I think we have free will. That, that's a whole other sermon. Uh, but he says, you know, some people think, oh, God scripted history? Well, that's not right. Um, and he goes on to say here, the fact that God has scripted history and that the rescue of his people is the punchline is cause for great optimism and celebration. Which brings us to our second application point, which is this, relax, God's got this. I don't know, maybe relax isn't the best word. What I'm really getting at here is what the angel tells Daniel in verse 18 he says, again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O oh man highly esteemed. He said, peace, be strong now, be strong. Here is how we find rest. Here is how we find peace in the midst of life's craziness. It's in his love, his peace, and his strength. Do you want more of that peace, love, and strength? Draw near to God. First, draw near to God in regular persistent prayer. Again, as we talk about in the Gospel of Luke, it's so pronounced that Jesus makes it such a priority to set apart time to be in the presence of God. Uh, we need that. If, if Jesus needs it, I need it. So how can you relax in the face of a chaotic world? By praying, trusting the chaos to him and receiving his love, his peace, and his strength. And you can do that on a daily basis. We're not talking pie-in-the-sky theology here, just theoretical stuff. Oh, that's what I believe about God. No, be with him tomorrow, and then on Tuesday, and then Wednesday, and then Thursday, spend time with him on Friday, we need his presence in our lives. Remember, that's what got Daniel into trouble early on because he was praying three times a day. We need it. We also draw near to God in his word. There are a bunch of opportunities for us to do that this fall. Listed in the lamplighter, Keith mentioned it, but again, there's extra copies just outside those doors there that list all kinds of great opportunities for us to be growing together. But you got to show if you want to grow. So again, it's just not, you know, oh, that would be, that's interesting. That's great that our church offers that. No, come join us. Let's grow together. Whether it's Sunday school or the New Life on Life studies, uh, ladies' Bible studies on Wednesday and then Thursday evening ladies' Bible studies, men's uh, breakfast. These are all opportunities for us to grow together. Uh, there's a training coming up on mentoring. Um, that's in addition to all the serving opportunities. Why do you think we do all these things? Is it because we're bored? 
No, it's because we know that God's word is truth and we need his truth and we need more input from him in a world that's giving us all kinds of other input. You want a really concrete way to apply today's sermon? So I mentioned this, but specifically, consider signing up for this new season of Life on Life. By the way, I think the topic is great. Yahweh reigns uh, in Psalms 91 and 100. It'll just be 10 Psalms over 10 weeks, and you'll meet five times with a group of three other people that Keith and I will work together to put together, uh, I think, a week from tomorrow. It's going to get started. So sign up. It's, it's a short commitment. That's part of the reason we do these this way. So it's not forever. It's just 10 weeks, 10 weeks uh, in the Word of God. We'll send you the studies every week, and then you can do the study. By the way, I think it's going to go really well with our new sermon series, Abide. I think it's a good fit uh, with that that we're going to be going through together starting two weeks from today. But a week from today, Life on Life begins. Thing is, we live in a noisy, chaotic world. And by the way, it's only going to get more noisy and chaotic the next few months as this presidential campaign goes on and on and on. But as followers of Jesus, we must remember that there is more to this life, more than the things you can touch and hear and see and smell. Uh, We have a new season upon us. Will you prioritize rhythms in your life that will enable you to experience more of his peace, of his love, and a greater perspective of his kingdom purposes. Let's pray. And Jesus, we proclaim again, even as we proclaimed in song this morning, that you are king. You are our king. We love you. We know that you know what is best for us. We want to live more and more in a manner that reflects who you are, who we are in you, and what you have called us to as your people. So Lord, would you continue to do your work in this body, even as we pray for that same work to be done in Sunset Church and Highlands and Church of the Beloved and East Renton Community Church and... uh, church across the road, the Nazarene church and Valley church. Uh, God, in all these churches here in our area that are preaching your word, that love you, God, would you strengthen those bodies this season? Let us grow in you. Let us have an increasing impact for your kingdom. And God, be glorified in us, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand for our benediction. And this is what we read in the conclusion of First Thessalonians. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen? Amen. Amen.